So that was the ordinary least squares. The next step is to look at what is called weighted least squares, because sometimes observations do not have the same variance. Sometimes observations are correlated. And then you will see later on that then you have problems with the ordinary least square setting. So the story is to some extent much the same. The main difference is that we now assume a covariance structure here that is not just the identity matrix, which is the case for the ordinary least squares estimator. And that means that what we want to minimize is now this thing where we just plug sigma inverse in the middle there. And how does that change things over here? Well, basically, it means that you just plug in sigma inverse here. Then you will also get it from differentiated. It will just stay there as a constant at the appropriate places. So we'll have a sigma inverse here. And you'll have a sigma inverse here. And then you get it in the outcoming expression solution down here, you also get the sigma inverse. So the structure for the estimator is the same. And again, of course, we're conditioning on x transpose sigma inverse x transpose uh, x that this is invertible. And an estimator of sigma here is very similar to what we did before. Again, we divide by n minus p, where p is the number of parameters that we estimated. So that was how to do the weighted least squares as an extension of the ordinary least squares, but how does it perform? One example is a fairly old paper about modeling the temporal correlation in hourly observations of the direct radiation in clear skies. So we're looking at the direct radiation and how that depends on the solar elevation. I think I've got the data here. So you have the solar elevation here, and then you have what is the radiation on the y-axis, and then we have a cloud of observations here. And what we see, the lines here, one particular line here is for a particular day. So what happens? The sun is rising and going down again. And then you have a different day. And what you see here is that when you look at observations from a particular day, then they are following, you can say, a trend, a shape here, but they are also following a correlation. So if you are below a, on a particular day, then you are expected to stay below for the entire day. Whereas sometimes if you are spot on, this is the fat line, draw, full drawn line in here is the estimator that we'll get to in a moment. But this is the thing here. Now, how you measure this radiation is to look at a surface, a planar surface, and then you look at how much energy is absorbed, absorbed by this level surface, on this level surface. So that means when the sun is rising, the angle of attack does something as to how large a proportion of the beam is actually hitting the particular surface where you do the measurement. So this is the relationship that is expected. It's similar to what we looked at before. We have a saturation here going to some level. And then we, the interesting part is how to pick the variance structure here for the, for the <coughs> weighted least squares estimator. We start with the, just using the identity matrix, or the IID, which gives you independent, identically distributed variables. But what we saw was also there was a correlation. So there's a Correlation so that if you get a negative error at some point, you also expect the same thing in the next observation and the next and the next. And then, of course, the next day is a new story. So on a within day, we expect a correlation, and we could express that as how long time difference is there, and take rho some coefficient to that power. Rho should then be a number that is less than 1. But given that we know that we measure on the surface, and we know that the solar angle changes so that effectively when the angle is low, we have a small part of the beam that is hitting, and when the angle is growing, we can have a larger part of the beam that hits this particular surface. That goes with the sine of the elevation angle, so 1 over that square will give you a variance component, and then we can combine these two. And now the question is, 
how do we work with this? First, we'll just look at maximum likelihood. So what we have here is that we have the observations. We say that they come from a normal distribution with a mean value structure and a covariance structure. And for now, we assume that the covariance structure here is known. And the maximum likelihood estimator here is exactly the same as the weighted least squares estimator. The estimator for sigma is slightly different. Look at it. There's one difference. And the difference is that we don't divide by n minus p, but just n, because we assume in this case that the theta is somewhat known. So it's biased for the variance, but it's unbiased for the estimator here. Now, if we do this and look at the model we had before, then we get an estimator of what is the level that we get to. We get an estimator of, let's just go back and show the, what the model was here. So we have the level A, and then we have something about the slope B here. So we have an estimator of the level and the slope, and then the variance estimator using the identity matrix as our covariance structure. Then we get a fairly low level, and we get a value for the slope here, and we get a fairly large estimate of the uncertainty. If we then introduce the correlation structure, where you say that measurements within the same day, they have some correlation, then we increase the estimate of the level and the variance of that. This is the standard error standard deviation of the estimated uh, parameter is reduced quite a bit. And the estimate of the slope is also quite a bit different from the initial estimate. And again, we're halving the standard deviation of that. And the estimate of the variance is also quite a bit smaller. Now, the for the residuals. Now, if you then, instead of having a correlation structure, include the variance structure, then we get a similar estimate here, again with a smaller uncertainty. We again step a little bit up in the slope here, but we again reduce the uncertainty on that. And then we see a huge drop in the estimate sigma out here, but we'll get back to that in a moment. And then if you combine these two structures and have both the variance structure and the correlation structure, then we get an even higher estimate of the level. And then we get an intermediate of these two estimate of the slope. Again, the uncertainty on that remains small. And the variance structure out here, the estimated variance becomes even smaller. So getting back to these variances out here. First of all, why are some numbers much, it's a factor of 10 greater than the others. Can you see that? Think of it for a second. I'll go back and look at the proposed variance structure here. So what happens here is that you have a diagonal here, sigma, where you have elements, where what you have is the elevation angle at some point and multiply it with the sine of an elevation angle at a different point. So the sine of some angle is always a number since we are having angles that are less than 90 degrees, we have a number between 0 and 1. So a number between 0 and 1, actually often not more than, say, 0.5, and you square that roughly, then you actually, the result you get out here is a factor of 4, but many, option, many observations would be at a lower angle, so then the factor here will be larger. So what you do here is that you effectively, by scaling the numbers in the sigma here, you are doing the reverse scaling of the lower case sigma square here. That is the assumed epsilon error here. So that's why you have a large reduction when you introduce the variant component to go from here to there. You get a factor of almost 10. Likewise, when you only have the correlation structure and then add the variant structure, you also have a factor of 10. That's an artifact, effectively. It's not because it's so much smaller. It's because of the construction of the covariance matrix. But what is important to notice here is that these estimates here, they differ quite a bit. And if you look, doing some residual analysis, you will see that it's the last one is the one that is most meaningful. So it's important to represent the variance structure if you have a structure 
in your data. That was the take home part for this part here. Now the properties of the maximum likelihood estimator that we saw just before is again a linear function of the observation because it's the same estimator as the ordinary least squares estimator. The estimator is unbiased. We have the variance estimator here. Same thing, it's efficient as well, saying it's a minimum variance of the unbiased estimators. So, and you can correct the estimated bias in sigma by not dividing by n, but dividing by n minus p to get the ordinary least squares, which is blue. Now, in practice, you do not know sigma. So, what do you do? There are different ways. One way to, to obtain an estimate of sigma is to use a so-called relaxation algorithm, where you just start with some estimate that could be just the identity matrix, or you could look at the correlation structure of a simple model. That's effectively what you do here. Then you, given this structure here, then you find the estimates of your parameters in the model. Then you look at the residuals from that, and then you look at the correlation structure from that those residuals, and then you select a new sigma, which you then reflects what happened there. Now, then you look at was this different from what you had the last time? If it was different, then you will repeat estimation and look at the residual structure, and then you will repeat those two steps until it converges. In practice, you will do, if you look at the example we had just before, there was only one parameter, that was a row, so what you have to do is find a good estimate of row, and in those cases where you only have very few parameters, this tends to converge in very, very few steps. Say, one, two, three. And there's a reference if you want to see further details. And of course, how do you pick convergence? That's a different story. Um, you probably look at how many decimal points do you want to have fixed, and then you say it's fine. 